So it's great to see all of you. And thank you for being here. This is the last session today of the writing series, Creative Writing. So we will talk about poetry today. And I am really excited because I love poetry. And I did a few activities involving poetry with students. I would have liked to have done even more, but um, I'm hoping that we can just talk openly today and I will share a slideshow as usual, but if you have comments or questions, just raise your hand and we can pause and, and have an open discussion as well. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. One moment. Okay, hopefully. Can you see a slideshow that says poetry? Great. Okay. So what do we think of when we think of poetry? Have any of you taught any kind of poetic form? Um, like one example would be a sonnet. Have any of you worked with a type of poem or poetry with students? I'm seeing mostly no. Anyone tried anything? Okay, that's really exciting because the good news is that poetry is everywhere. And even if you think you haven't done any poetry with students, you probably have, because in my view, poetry is just in language. So as a language teacher or as a teacher, we are working with language and poetry is everywhere. So even here on this screen, you see um, a worksheet I found online. It's so simple. It's an alphabet poem where you have a theme and you brainstorm a word for every letter of the alphabet. This is poetry, okay? Anything where we're playing with words and playing with language can be counted as poetry and um, don't be afraid of it. I think poetry can sound, it can, people can get nervous because um, it sounds like something that's separate from our day-to-day -day lives, but I think it's everywhere. I see poetry in street signs, in labels on things, you can find it, it's ubiquitous. So today I want to first talk about why would we teach poetry with high school students? Um, I had a few reasons, but there are many. It's going to help students with all the writing practices we've talked about in the previous lessons. So things like being descriptive with their writing, um, things like being able to write a scene. We will talk today about narrative poetry, which is telling a story. And it's also reminding us that language is holistic. So there's the thing that's being said, but there's also so much more context, tone, and then with poetry, you have things like rhythm. So poetry can bring new perspectives and it can also give us something emotionally as well, which is really nice. So I wanted to share one example. This would be, this is pretty advanced. So it's more just for teachers or high level students. But this is a poem by the Jamaican poet, Claude McKay. He was a Jamaican American man and he wrote this sonnet. You can see it's a sonnet. And uh, it's called, If We Must Die. And it was written in 1919. It's actually about race riots and fighting for justice in the United States because he was a black man and this was really important to him. But, over time, so there's a picture of Claude McKay, the poet. Over time, his words got picked up and there became this myth, this legend that Winston Churchill recited this poem to the US Congress trying to convince Americans, the US Congress, to join in World War II against the Nazis. So there, this myth, this legend grew that Winston Churchill used this poem of a Jamaican man in order to rally support for the war because it's a very um, 
almost it's a violent poem it's calling for people to stand up and fight back so there are some lines in here oh kinsmen we must meet the common foe and this legend started that that churchill uh recited this some people said he recited it in the u.s congress other people said he recited it in the british house of commons and this legend grew and grew but then some researchers looked into this and they could find zero evidence that Churchill ever did this. Okay, so they said, actually, I don't think Churchill ever used this poem. <laughs> so that's really weird. And it makes it makes one wonder, well, why do people say he did? And there could be many reasons. First, the style of the poem itself. Um, the poem is a Shakespearean sonnet. So McKay is using this Victorian style to convey a very urgent political message. So he's using an older style to talk about something that's happening now in the present. Well, in 1919. Another reason is that his words are very inspiring. They're saying, let's fight back. So even though the poem was written for a specific meaning, it's possible for a politician to change the meaning and to use it for something else. Okay, to fight to fight against the Nazis. So it could be seen as a call for good versus evil. It also is a call for using violence to fight violence. And there are various interpretations. And we also know that Churchill really loved the poet Alfred Lord Tennyson. So it's possible he also was a big poetry reader. We don't, we don't know. So I, why am I bringing all of this up? Um, simply because Poems teach us about history. And I really believe this. Uh, they are a kind of looking glass or a prism through which we can examine history in a more interesting, more engaging way with words, with stories, and even with characters. So here are some ancient muses of poetry that I found online. They look nice. And I think a really good discussion you could have with students before even delving into any poems is just asking students if they can think of any times in real life where we might use poems. This could be an open discussion for one lesson. Have you ever seen a poem? Uh, when do you use them? So some ideas I came up with are when we have bad news, sometimes we turn to poetry. I know. On Instagram, there's a lot of inspirational poetry. So if students are on TikTok or Instagram, they might actually already follow accounts that have inspirational quotes, or they might follow poetry accounts already. We also use it at celebrations, life cycle events. I could you could include graduations, it's the season of high school and college graduations, and you might get a card with a poem inside uh, as a toast before a meal. As in the case of Churchill during a speech to persuade or for a romance. So there are really a lot of ways that we use poems. And in today's society, I would say we're, we tend to read more shorter poems than say 100 years ago. Um, so we'll talk a bit more about that. Now, today I'm going to share with you a few forms that you can use with students. Why forms? Well, for English language learners or anyone writing, having a form or a template is going to really help. It's going to give some ground to stand on. And once you've practiced with a form, then you might feel more comfortable writing in what we call free verse, which is a poem that doesn't follow any rhyme scheme or any plan. Free verse is just you get to make it up. But I think it's nice to practice some forms before moving to free verse, because free verse is a bit open ended. So today we're going to look at ballad poetry, haiku and haibun, limerick, concrete or shape poetry, and Diamante, which you can see in the picture below, is a poem that's shaped like a diamond. 
And we'll look at that more carefully at the end of the lesson. But we're going to be moving from what I would say is the most complicated to maybe the easiest form. So let's dive in with ballad poetry. This one's a little bit tricky, but we will we will look at it. Okay, so ballad poetry, where did it come from? The 14th century. Traditionally, this was uh, received through oral tradition. So people were just singing these incredibly long poems and passing them down through generations. There's a few things that a ballad must do. It has to tell a story. So that's why it's nice we're doing poetry last because we've already practiced telling stories in the narrative fiction lesson and in narrative nonfiction on Monday. So ballads are poems, but they're also telling a story. There's typically an impersonal narrator, and this would mean a third person narrator. So you don't have an eye, you just have a voice telling the story. There is a rhyme scheme. The second and the fourth lines must rhyme. And there also is a meter, which has to do with the beats or the pulses in the lines. And meter gets pretty tricky. I myself need more practice with it. So when teaching ballads, I would focus more on the rhyme scheme and trying to get students to rhyme and less on the meter, unless it's your specialty to understand a meter and then go for it. But we'll look at some examples. Um, today, the word ballad is used more freely. It no longer necessarily means poem. We sort of use it for music now. So Taylor Swift writes ballads. And you could have a lesson where you look at lyrics um, and, and talk about if lyrics are poetry because we know Bob Dylan won a Nobel Prize for literature. So there's a really strong connection between lyrics and poetry. So students might, a modern day ballad, I think the closest analog would be um, a musician who's writing songs that tell stories. Okay, so Taylor Swift or Bob Dylan. Now, yes, a ballad must tell a narrative. The most famous textbook example would be this really wild poem by Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Uh, it's called The Rime of the Ancient Mariner. And it is about a sailor who returns from a really harrowing journey and he tells his story to someone who's listening. And we'll, you could do part of the Ancient Mariner with students, but it would need to be students who have a very high level of English because even for a native speaker of English, the language in this poem is quite different than, than today's English. Uh, so I said, what's going on in this text? Just looking at it, to even understand what's going on, we have to read it really closely. And this practice of close reading is what I recommend you do with students when approaching a poem. Um, so we can look at the, the first stanza. It is an ancient mariner and he stoppeth one of three. Okay, what does that mean? There's this old sailor and every three people who walk, who walks by him, he's stopping one of them. Uh, and then there's a quote by the long gray beard and glittering eye now wherefore stoppest thou me so who is speaking now it's not the sailor it's one of the people he stopped he says the bridegroom's doors are opened wide and i am next of kin the guests are met the feast is set maced here the merry den so now the wedding guest he stops is saying, why are you stopping me? I have to get to this wedding. And the quote ends and the ancient mariner grabs him. He holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoth he. And then the other guy says, hold off, unhand me. Graybeard loon, it's an insult in these times. Graybeard loon, it's a little different, but. Um, F stoons his hand dropped he, and he drops his hand. So uh, why are we doing this? Well, as you can see, it's 
really complicated to understand this type of English because it's so old fashioned. So what I would do if you were to approach a poem like this is to make it fun by just being open and honest of how silly and different the language is. Take a small section and just close read that with students and that can be the whole lesson. Um, now, if that seems too advanced, you can find some ballads that are shorter because the Ancient Mariner poem goes on for, I don't know, 400 stanzas. It's really long. Uh, it ends up with an albatross gets involved and there's a curse and there's ghosts. It's really, really long. So if you want something shorter, I found this one online. It still has the rhyme scheme that you want to follow. You can see lines one and three of every stanza rhyme, went, discontent, oak, spoke. Then we have dead, said, lost, frost. So looking at a shorter poem like this, you can just talk with students about the rhyme, the rhyming, and maybe generate some lists of rhymes. So practice rhyming different words. In some, you can also find rhyming dictionaries, which are really great to use. And then how to actually teach this. Again, there's nothing wrong with using worksheets. I would even suggest having a worksheet where after you've looked at a ballad, students can write their own. And I would focus on two things here. The ballad should tell a story. It should be following the rhyme scheme. So those two things I think are going to provide a decent structure for students to get started on their own idea. Now, what if they can't come up with an idea for the story part? I suggest this activity, which would be writing a tabloid ballad. Uh, the goal would be to use this form, the ballad form, to tell a news story. So you can go online and find some funny or offbeat news. and students can choose an article or choose a story they find interesting and that can be the story of their ballad um, this really happened this one in the middle it was in a town in india and a, a businessman dropped his phone into a into a dam and the city he claimed there was really important information on the phone so they drained an entire reservoir or lake to retrieve his phone which was dead of course it was broken <laughs> Um, and apparently it was enough water to cover 15 acres of land or something like that. So also this story is true. There's apparently a Prince Harry lookalike running around. So if you have students interested in the royals, you can write about this. Or there's nothing wrong with writing a ballad about a typical day at school, okay? Outlining what happens from the minute you get up to when you go home. Okay, I'm checking the time, we're okay. So any questions on ballads? Like I said, this is probably the hardest one since it's, um, since you have to rhyme, you have to have a story. There's a lot of pieces. One tip I have, oops, uh, for ballads is the first line should always just jump into the action. So there's typically very little setup in a ballad. And you can, the same is true if you're looking at Taylor Swift lyrics or lyrics of, of pop singers. They generally just jump into the action. Okay, so now we'll look at a form that's a little bit shorter. Has anyone tried haiku? Okay, this is going to be shorter and easier to accomplish with students in one lesson. I just did this with students. It was really fun. So for haiku, there it's a Japanese form. It also is an ancient tradition. There is no rhyming. The most important rule, there's three lines. The whole poem is three lines long. And you have to count the syllables in each line. So the first line will have five syllables, the second line will have seven, and the third line will have five again. So it's a five, seven, five. You can use punctuation in interesting ways with haiku, and we'll look at that. And traditionally, 
in Japan, haiku was used to describe nature. So this activity can be fun to do even outside or after a class trip somewhere because it's really nice to describe the natural world using haiku. I always encourage students to write first and then fix the syllables later because the, the challenge here is getting the syllables to be 575. And finally, haiku can evoke specific moods. So we'll look at that. So here are some examples. Um, Basho is a Japanese poet who was famous for the haiku. So here is one in Kyoto, hearing the cuckoo, I long for Kyoto. And that's the whole poem. You can count the syllables. This one does not quite follow the 575, but it's close. In Kyoto, so it's four. Hearing the cuckoo, it's five. I long for Kyoto. So this one is not following the rhyme scheme that I just, or the, the syllable scheme, but start with students, follow the scheme, then you can depart from it. He was a master haiku writer. So I guess in this one, he departed from the form. I didn't check that before this presentation. Interesting. Let's look at this one. Uh, right? Yeah, these ones are not following the 575. My examples don't match up with the rule I've just given you, but you can go online and you'll find hundreds of haikus that follow 575. Once your students can write 575 haiku, then I would encourage you to play with the form and they can not follow the syllable rule. Um, I looked at this one yesterday with a student the one below that says lily out of the water out of itself i looked at it with a student and unprompted the student just said to me um it's about depression i was like wow that's really a deep astute comment so my tip with haiku and with poetry in general is students will naturally understand the mood of poems you don't have to hide um, intense or dark emotions from them. I think that poetry can really help us process these emotions and students will pick up on that right away. So we talked about how this poem could be about mental health, but also it's an image that makes sense because if you take a lily out of the water, it's no longer going to grow. And so we talked about the metaphorical dimensions as well as the image of the, of the flower. So there's a lot to talk about with haiku, even though they're really short. For example, in the Kyoto example, you can talk about onomatopoeia, which Christina, there's a Czech word for this. Uh, my students taught me it, but I forgot. I know we've discussed it, but I don't remember. I'll check, I'll check. Yes, there's, but there's, a, there's a Czech word, in English we say onomatopoeia, it's the term for a word that sounds like itself. It sounds like Cytoslovce. I think it's Cytoslovce. Like, yay, or um, I don't know. My colleague just said, uh, ouch. Another example would be ouch. Okay, so the word sounds like the word. So onomatopoeia is great. Squeak, squeak or something squeak. like that. Yeah. Excellent. This is great for haiku because this word here, cuckoo, it's the sound those birds make. I don't know what they're called in Czech, but we call them cuckoo birds. It's like a type of parrot, I think. But the sound they make is cuckoo, like a clock. So you have cuckoo clocks. And this is a, a kind of thing you can play with. Okay, moving on. So with haiku, I encourage you to discuss with students what tone poems are in, are they sad, are they happy, but there's so many more tones, right? There's many more tones and emotions to discuss. Um, maybe the writer may evokes a very calm feeling. Maybe it's forceful, the poem, maybe it's a bit guarded. 
So these words in, are a whole lesson in themselves because these are very advanced vocabulary words. So you would have to really come up with some definitions, translate these words to discuss tone. Oops, and you can find them online. Now, what is haibun? A haibun is, um, oh no, I covered up basho. I didn't mean to. Well, haibun is combining prose and haiku. So it should be the pro one short paragraph of prose written in the present tense, and this should have many images. And then this section of prose is followed by a haiku that deepens the meaning or adds to the meaning. So someone last class asked me to introduce some more modern writers of poetry, and I wanted to share this writer here on the right, Amy Nazuka Matil. And she is an American writer, really an excellent author. She's published many poetry books, including a book about this form, about the haibun. So here is one haibun that she wrote. You can see the length is doable. And if it seems long, the prose section can even be a bit shorter. And here she's describing a scene in present tense. Only a few people and three alley cats remember when the house was gray, not yellow. A pair of empty swing sets at the schoolyard rock themselves to sleep for a late afternoon nap. A blue dog used to trot on top of little ginkgo fans confettied on the sidewalk like he showed up too late to a parade. And it goes on. It's describing a quiet scene in a neighborhood. And then it ends with an image of some alley cats who have chickadee or bird wings in their mouths. And the haiku at the end says, every gate is her red mouth on fire. Birds want to speak, but cannot. So maybe this complicates the meaning of what came before. To me, it's a little ominous. Birds want to speak, but cannot. To me, that makes me think of climate change. It makes me think of cats eating birds. It's a bit ominous. So it contrasts with the quiet, calm scene that was described before. So studying this poem also gives us a lot of great examples of literary devices, such as personification. A pair of empty swing sets rock themselves to sleep. Or simile, a blue dog used to trot like he showed up too late to a parade. So I recommend this author. She writes a lot of nature poems. She writes a lot about animals. And the language is going to be at a pretty high level. But if you have advanced students, um, I would recommend her poems to check some more of them out. OK, now we have about 15 minutes. So we're going to look at limericks. Have you heard of limericks before? Some people are nodding. Okay, Lenka is nodding. Cool. A few people have. Excellent. So these also follow a specific form. It's going to be a short poem, five lines long. There's a rhyme scheme. The first two lines rhyme, then the second two rhyme, and then the final line rhymes with the first two. So it's A, A, B, B, A. Uh, the third and fourth lines should be a little bit shorter. And these are usually silly poems. So we will, uh, a good time to do this if you're teaching an English class would be around St. Patrick's Day, which is celebrated in March because that's a holiday commonly celebrated in uh, the US because of Irish immigrants. And I don't know the full history of St. Patrick's Day, but I'm sure you could make a lesson out of it. And then also add limericks, which come from Ireland. So here is a really classic example. It's probably the first one I found online. Uh, there was an old man with a beard who said, it is just as I feared, two owls and a hen, Four larks and a wren have all built their nests in my beard. Okay, so it's like 
medium funny, but we can do better. But this gives you an idea of the rhyming and how it should sound. And these poems have a really sing-songy fun rhythm. It's, um, how do I pronounce this? Anapestic, which means there are these little beats. Um, it sounds like da-da-doom, da-da-doom. So that's uh, these, the first two lines have it twice. Um, there was an old man with a beard who said, it is just, as I feared. And then the next two lines have it just once. So two owls and a hen, four larks and a wren. So it's this da da do. So you have two short words followed by a longer word. So these can be really fun to read out loud and um, try to really say it with the rhythm. That will help when you try to write one if you can hear the rhythm. Yes, an anapest is da da do. Again, uh, use worksheets. It's fine. I will make sure you have these slideshows, and I've linked in the slideshows to these worksheets. Um, so, for example, this is a screenshot of one of the worksheets that gives the students the rules and an example. That's not how I would describe the anapest rhythm, but other than that, the worksheet looks correct. So you might have to make a correction, but it looks pretty good. And my tip again with Limerick is to tell a story. Put the subject or the main character in the first line. It can also end with their name. So a line that commonly opens Limericks is there once was a man or woman or there once was a fox named Christina, <laughs> then that's a perfectly good way to start. You have a character in your first line and then you have four more lines to just describe something funny that happens to this character and it can be something weird or surprising. So encourage students to follow the structure and if you want to grade them, you can grade them on did they follow the structure and the rhyming. And you can try to end with a twist or a surprise. Here's another example of an, a worksheet. That would be good for younger students. And this worksheet gives you even more scaffolding, right? They are telling you, they're giving you sentence starters for every line. So you could make up your own sentence starters if you wanted to. Um, or you can just give students five blank lines. It's up to you. Okay, any questions on limericks? We have one more form and then there should be a few minutes for questions. Okay, we will look at concrete or shaped poetry. This is really fun. Um, so Concrete or shaped poetry is poetry that is written in the shape of what it's describing or what its theme is. So this one is about flowers. You can see this plant, the shape of the plant, and there's words and letters on the stems. This became really popular in the US in the 1950s and 60s. Also in Europe, um, there were a lot of experimental poets working with this type of, of poetry. And it can be a good way to focus in on a specific literary technique. So I'll show an example of an activity to do with this. But first, here are a few more beautiful examples. The Swan and Shadow is a really famous one by an artist and poet named John Hollander, again in the 60s. So this is a beautiful example. You can read the poem, but you can also just enjoy the image that it's creating. And it depends on your school, but 
if there's an opportunity perhaps to collaborate with an art teacher, this could be a good way to do that. Um, because the image matters just as much as the words in, in these poems. And this is an example from a French writer, Il Plou, so it rains, and it should look a bit like rain coming down in these lines. I'm not sure. I, and it's written in French. And here is a more relatable example. Uh, hopefully we don't have to do this again, but here is a poet by a living writer, uh, Juan Felipe Herrera, and he wrote a poem called Social Distancing. And you can see how the poem is evoking through its shape that feeling of what it was like. So he has some lines. And it's about, I think, maybe the good parts of getting through the pandemic, maybe it's about the way we helped and healed each other. Because as you can see in the center, it's healing begins. So that's the core message, is healing begins. And then his notes on the side say things like, love flourishes for the first time, but also grocery bags have a tendency to wobble. So he's evoking different aspects of this experience we all went through. And I think um, you could definitely share this poem with students and do something similarly following the shape of a circle where you have a center idea and then coming off of that different aspects of the idea. The hard part is where he, it's actually written completely upside down. <laughs> And here's an activity I came up with connected with shape poetry. If you want to practice a literary device such as personification or metaphor or simile, you can use this activity. So first you will gather some slips of paper and you'll want to write different nouns on them. I like to use things from nature, so mountain, flower, um, but in this example, you could write shoe or you can have students write different objects and places and then students will draw a slip and that will be their topic and they will have to practice a literary device using that topic so if it's personification they should write three or five sentences about this topic trying to use personification so if they have a mountain i have a sentence here um, the mountain stood silently and watched us like an old teacher and you could say uh, mist covered the mountain like strands of hair. It's not a very good one. <laughs> you, this is not easy. So uh, it might be easier with, with simile, but you can, you can see. Then they will draw their object. So they could draw the mountain or if they have a shoe, as in this example, they can draw it and use the sentences they wrote to create the shape poem. So they might have to thinly draw the line and write the words under or above it and then erase the line. Um, that's why you might want to get an art teacher involved <laughs> with this activity. But if you spend some time, the results can be, can be really beautiful. In this example, they did not use a literary device. They just wrote about the object. They just wrote, I like sneakers, and they wrote a description of shoes. So squeaky, old, worn, comfortable. You can do that as well. Simply describe an object and create the shape. That's my colleague's, <laughs> my colleague's dog, sorry. <laughs> On it's, that reminding, note, it's reminding us of time. That's perfect. So, oh, this is the last slide. So this is a type of shape poem and it's probably um, 
one of the easier forms because you can find find this uh, form easily and it's to compare speaking of dogs compare two opposite things so at the top of the diamond you'll have your subject and at the very bottom you'll have its direct opposite so you could do summer winter you could do um yes cat dog all kinds of things and then you practice different types of words so adjectives verbs nouns to fill in the different parts of this diamond shape and in the end you have a really delightful poem that looks like a diamond and compares two things so this is a really fun type of shaped poem that you can do with students at any level and they look really nice and that is all the time we have so i'm really happy that you joined me for this lesson and are there any questions we have three minutes but i'm happy for any feedback or questions or comments as usually i have a question if i may uh the example you gave about a student saying that a poem was evoking depression i think it's a good example of how students can also reveal their own emotions uh via associations that poetry will give them do you think it can ever be dangerous or sensitive or do you have any experience or advice how to navigate those situations yeah absolutely i have a few thoughts on that i think first that this student was more comfortable saying that because we were in a very small group of people they were familiar with like friends i don't know i think what i face more often when teaching poetry was the reaction kind of an impression that poetry is always really sad kind of a preconceived notion from students that it, it's sad. So I think um, that's more common, this preconceived notion, than students sharing their own emotions, in my experience. Um, so I would suggest just bringing your full self to poetry and sharing some examples that are funny, like doing the limericks, you know, doing something fun, and then also be open to sharing sad or even sentimental poetry and see what comes up in class and and don't be afraid of the emotions um i think it's it's great if a student wants to open up in that way that's that's really brave of them so if they if they say something a little alarming you can always just say you know thank you for sharing and come back to that later with them one on one But yes, I hope that that answered your question. Hi, uh, I do not have a question, but uh, I have to leave now. So I just want to say goodbye and thank you for uh, the whole series because I really enjoyed it and I couldn't make it all the time. But I'm very grateful uh, Fulbright Commission could uh, do the YouTube recording. So it, it's great. So I watch them all. And thank you, Celeste. And uh, bye from Trutnov. And I have to leave now. So sorry. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Thank you so much for participating. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes. And as Christina just noted in the chat, there will be a feedback form. So please give me feedback. Uh, it's the first time I've tried something like this, and um, I would, would love to know how it went for you, what was useful, what wasn't useful. That would be great. If there are no questions, I have one more comment. I really liked one of the, the shape poems, because I feel like that could easily appeal to students who are maybe a little bit less confident with language, but more confident with arts and other creative expressions. So I really like that uh, it gives more opportunity to students who maybe whose skills are limited, but they are very strong drawers or painters. Yeah, absolutely. And and if they are drawing 
an object or something that they're interested in, it gives them that incentive to to write and to to look up more words and make their shape home. Yeah, that's great. If I may, I just would like to say thank you. And I'm definitely going to start with limericks and then going hopefully all the way to ballad poetry. Um, you know, writing lyrics for for songs, that would be something I'm, I'm sure they would be interested in. So definitely, definitely very, very useful, very practical. I'm going to give it a go. Great. Maybe next week already for our last lesson or first in September. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah, I I would love to hear how it, how it goes. So yeah, be in touch. Okay, thank you very much. So I think that's that's everyone. Any but more general questions, perhaps about also any of the previous lessons or overall? This is your opportunity. Yes. If not, we don't want to add any more pressure <laughs> if there are no questions. But I've shared the link to the feedback form. I'll send it in an email uh, later today or tomorrow morning, probably, because I would also like uh, to ask Celeste um, to give me access to all the presentations. I'll upload them to a shared disk, and then I'll send in that same email access to all the recordings together with all the presentations where you will have the sources. And please, the only price we ask you to pay for this great course is the feedback form. So please give us feedback so that we know how to do similar things better or what other things you would like to explore in the future with Celeste or some of our other assistants. Thank you. Thanks so much, Christina. And yes, it's it's great to see all of you and share writing with you. So thank you very welcome. much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Bye. Bye.